then we'll all move around. <laughs> Hi. Thank you so much for making this amazing film, all of you. Uh, it's just it, it's fantastic, right? Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. We're so lucky to have so many of you here, too, to discuss it. Um, it just, you took this film from, you know, you, you threw us with The Hurt Locker. We were immersed into it. I think with Zero Dark Thirty, too, we were like boots on the ground. And here you put the viewer inside the Algiers Motel in such a powerful way. And, you know, the aftermath, the lead up, all of that, but we just, we feel like we're there. What was your thinking about making it center specifically around that incident? Because I have to admit, I didn't know about that incident. And most people I talked to didn't know about it either. It seems like it became like a footnote in history. Well, that really is um, kind of was the motivating principle was the fact that no, you know, I certainly, I didn't know. It had sort of um, been, I suppose, secreted away for 50 years, and yet it felt so contemporaneous. It was presented to be um, the story to me by Mark Bull in, I think, late 2014, early 2015, right about the time of the decision not to indict the officer in the Michael Brown mm. shooting. And then I heard this story, and I thought, wait a minute, that's 50 years ago. This is today. How is this possible? And so, you know, that you're kind of conflating these two time periods. And so I felt it was an important story to tell. And, and at the same time, though painful, obviously not as painful for the participants of, the, of that event, but to put the audience in the Algiers so that you're recreating it um, in as, as viscerally palpable a way as possible. Absolutely. And the resonance that it's taken mm. on since then, too, with Charlottesville and all the other things that have, that have transpired makes us feel that much more immediate and that much more powerful. Um, so you did a lot of research. Mark Bull did a lot of research going back to 2014. How, how did you track down the people? I know there were a lot of people involved. There was a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist. How did that, how did that go? Well, actually, the um, Detroit Free Press did a lot of reporting on it as well, and there were four journalists um, at, the at the Detroit Free Press that won uh, Pulitzers for the reporting on it. So there was, there, uh, gratefully, there was a lot of research uh, to be had. We did many FOIA requests, and we were able to get court testimonies and transcripts and... and um, autopsy reports, I mean, uh, the coroner report, et cetera, et cetera. So it was very, pretty rigorous, the research. I think if you're ever approaching something that's somewhat, you know, real, you know, you want it to be accurate, you want it to be as authentic as possible, as you can possibly make it. There were some elements uh, where there were discrepancies, and in that case, Mark was, I think, incredibly skillful in how he fabricated the areas, which were very slight, that had to be kind of uh, knitted together. But um, it was, you know, a lot of research, and that's also how we came across all the documentary footage that then got beautifully, in, in my opinion, beautifully yes. integrated um, <laughs> by these two extraordinary uh, editors, both Billy and Harry. And so, yeah, really that's amazing. Cool. And how that was that was my next question, actually, how you work that in in such a seamless way, the archival footage into you know what she is is she you and and uh, Barry Ackroyd the cinematographer how how does that work it must have been a challenge well we got a hold of all that footage um, like a month before shooting maybe yeah. and we Harry and I went through it um, separately actually and sort of cataloged it and you know the, and saw what footage related to different parts of the film and different parts of the well, the script at that point and then while cutting it just sort of naturally came to fit into sequences that we were lucky to find an exterior of the Fox Theater um, that was the day of the actual uh, you know, th event at the Fox Theater. So we found all the stuff of the same street that, that, that the riots happened on. So we, w and then when cutting it, we were looking for sort of similar images, you know, the complementary images so that there would be a seamless transition between the documentary footage and, and the way Barry and Ka Catherine shot it. And obviously, obviously the way it's shot really helps too, you know, that the fact that it's shot in a really 
it was shot with digital cameras, but with 16 millimeter lenses, so it has a real raw and rough look. So it it did it did blend fairly well already. And um, even though the aspect ratio of the of the frame changes, because you're so immersed in it, I think you don't really even notice. Yeah, and I still remember the. Oh, yeah. oh, sorry, sorry this, I still remember the first cut in which it really sang, and it was one of the cuts that Billy made where you saw um, someone throw a Molotov cocktail in front of a storefront, and there was that kind of um, wire uh, fence outside of it, and then we found a, Billy found a shot that looked so similar, almost as if you had just gone from that tight shot to the wide, mm -hmm. and I think that was kind of a governing principle as we started looking for similar elements that would make it feel seamless in a way, and it's just a testament to the production design and everybody involved in creating those sets that there was such a sense of that place that it allowed for those cuts to happen. And Vicky, I wanted to ask you about the casting too because I understand that there was some role playing initially in, in well, I guess it was probably right after you had cast, or how did the, how does it all, how did you all put it together? Um, we really just, uh, it was kind of like a little mini boot camp, I think, our, <laughs> our casting <laughs> sessions. <laughs> Uh, where you know actors came back several times, and we used different combinations of actors and different improvs, and we maybe once actors got to a certain point, we'd show them a scene and now do the scene that's actually in the script. We had uh, we initially started out with uh, material that wasn't in the film, but material that we hoped would kind of duplicate kind of the essence of the movie. So we we uh, auditioned with scenes from In the Heat of the Night and and from uh, that Netflix movie about making of a murderer. We used that material when we were reading for the cops. So it was, um, we started off there. Eventually, if, if people made it past a certain point, you know, they got into the room with Catherine and we actually used, you know, uh, uh, scenes from the script. And we just uh, mixed and matched and tried to, as best as we could, try to put an actor from, you know, 2017 from Los Angeles or wherever, Atlanta or wherever they're from, into that frame of mind, into that situation in the Algiers Motel. And it was very hard and intense and trying when we were, uh, we were doing that. It was, very ex it was a very exhausting casting process. Did you have discussions on set? Because if you mentioned they're all actors from 2017, they're young. They this is this is something historical that many of them may not have even known about. How do you lead into that? Were there discussions in general about about race or just specifically about this that went on? All different um, discussions. I mean, talking with the police officers like Will Poulter and and um, Ben O'Toole. Um, uh, they were conversations about the consequences of playing a character that reprehensible, mm -hmm. you know, and, and are they prepared to, to take that on? Mm -hmm. And did they understand, which they did beautifully, and, um, and knowing, of course, that there will be moments when the film is completed that they'll be talking about that character. And it's not a character that's obviously ever going to be likable. However, my hope, and I think what's happening, is admired for the talent and the and the um, characterization and how how authentic it felt. Um, but at the same time, very very intense. And with the uh, algae and Jojo and and all the and the boys, of course, they were just. I mean, there was a kind of beautiful. Uh, innocence with which they approach the material. And I tried, I think both Vicky and I tried to protect that as long as we could. Because in fact, the real victims, of course, had no knowledge of what was going to transpire that night. They went to the Algiers, as you know, you just saw the movie, f for refuge, you know, for safety, to get out of the way of this riot. And in fact, they couldn't have, have been in a worse situation and nor could they have ever anticipated that and I wanted to protect that naivete um, as long as I could. I heard that in order to do that did you you didn't let them know certain scenes were being filmed? Tell us about that. Well what I did with the victims, not with the rest of the cast, but um, but 
it's actually a tactic that, uh, well, because I've worked with Barry, a couple of movies, and he's worked quite a lot with Ken Loach. That's yeah. a tactic that Ken Loach uses is that you don't necessarily um, share the entire screenplay. So you're just like you would be if you were a victim. You, um, or any of us, we don't know what tomorrow may bring or hold. And so that, again, that kind of innocence was really, I think, really palpable. You didn't know, you know, am I the character that's going to die? Am I not the character that's going to die? So there was this tremendous sense of honest anticipation that, of course, you would have anyway with such a tense experience. Speaking of the tension, too, it, it felt very claustrophobic and, and raw. Um, it must have been hard to tap into that kind of emotion and pain, because I, I do remember Will Poulter saying that he, at one point, broke down and cried. I think we kind of, in a way, all did, if not visibly, internally, but um, there was a tremendous camaraderie between the cast and the crew, and I think everybody was extremely um, protective of one another. And But I remember going out on, I, you know, I said, cut, we're taking a break for a minute, and went out onto the porch, and I found Will out there with his head in his hands. I mean, to play a character like that, it's just such an, in my humble opinion, an astonishing performance. And what it took for him to do that every day, it's the opposite. I mean, this is somebody who, um, I don't know, just there's so much love in this in this individual, but the, um, the degree of intensity and commitment and dedication that he made to that character so that in watching a movie like this, which of course is why you make a movie like this, in an effort to, um, you know, speak about race in this country especially, and how, um, you know, kind of trying to find a way to course correct it. And you had as consultants the real Melvin Dismukes, played by John Boyega, uh, Larry Reed, I understand too, played by Algie. Um, how did that work out? Were they on the set? No, but we did have Julie, uh, who played the character of Julie in the movie, but the real Julie was there with me every single day on the set, and she'd you know, look at every take, and I'd uh, look over my shoulder, and she'd be you know, giving me a thumbs up or, or a, a beautiful detail, like the detail of, of um, Karen's hand or her hand covering Karen's hand on the wall that came from her you know just beautiful details but um, Melvin we met with I met with John Boyega with him prior to shooting and he and Larry um, I met with just before we were shooting and then at the end um, he came over when we were shooting the Motown scene there's actually a tiny little cameo of him in the in the control room but he's um, you can tell both of them were very broken to this day by that night and Larry's never talked about it since right? no mm -mm. so what what propelled him to talk was it with Tamark or how did he first yeah involved? I think both of them it's the idea of of and for Julie wanting this story to be heard and seen and addressed and acknowledged and you know I mean this is going on constantly look at the um, you know Philandro Castile and Trevon Martin and and uh, Michael Brown etc so it's just you know it's an effort to add to that conversation in the hope that it can somehow um, you know, I mean, I, I firmly believe that people can learn from one another and that people can change. Mm -hmm. So I suppose it, with that aspiration in mind. Mm -hmm. Speaking of the weight of that, though, you, thinking about where it's taken us in history, I was thinking about the two of you going through the footage. Did that weigh on you? Did that take its toll? Did you find yourself, like, dreaming about it? Well, it certainly took its toll in watching the dailies and and I don't think there's ever been a time in my career I've really been affected so emotionally. And I, I think I can speak for Harry as well. There were times where, you know, we would watch dailies and cry because it was just, and that was uncut footage. And then it became even more powerful um, when it was edited. But yeah, it was really difficult. It was, and it was, I, I don't think I went home and dreamt about it, but the days were hard because we were trying to make it authentic. And like you say, put the audience, you know, in there with, 
with those kids. And um, and as an editor, you're trying to make people, the only way you can make somebody feel something is to feel it yourself. So um, we you know, we were feeling it along along with the audience, you know, so it was, it was very difficult. Yeah, I, I think um, as Catherine's mentioning, we kept, as we were watching the footage and as we were trying to put it together, we kept thinking of things outside the frame. And even, even during the director's cut, we would have these long conversations during lunch about um, how uh, it, how resonant the footage and the scenes felt with everything that was going on. And it just made us that much more motivated to, uh, to try to do the best that we could to honor um, that intention is to try to to try to um, get people talking about this thing that we we were feeling on a daily basis. So, what have you heard from some of the people who did experience it or lived in Detroit? Have you what kind of reaction have you gotten from people after they've seen it? Well, I know that um, the police chief saw it, uh, James Craig, and. Um, and he wants to use it as a training vehicle in his uh, uh, in 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 his protocol, and um, so he was very moved by it. Uh, African American Museum in Detroit, they were very um, very moved by it. So uh, the response, certainly within the city, has been um, really really powerful. I wanted to ask you too about the, um, I love the panels of Jacob Lawrence, the African American artist, how that came about and you also used the text of Henry Louis Gates Jr. Yeah. How did how did you, because I, I love that you put it into that context and but to use something like that was, was really artful. How did that come well, about? Well, thank you. Well, I um, it's really from conversations with Billy and Harry and um, realizing that and, and also looking at the historical context of an event like this, like a rebellion and the hundreds of rebellions that were happening at that time and looking, trying to look to the, antece the cultural and sociological antecedents and realizing that if you're angry enough to burn your own house down, that's not just because they raided your nightclub, you know? And unfortunately, if, if we hadn't had that prologue, you wouldn't necessarily have the information of the Great Migration, which the painter who painted that um, series of panels called the Great Migration. His name is Jacob Lawrence, and in fact, his work is at the Museum of Modern Art and the Phillips Collection in DC. And um, beautiful series of panels, as you can, I mean, uh, hopefully as you can tell. And yet it paints that picture of the millions and millions of African Americans moving from the south to the north in the hope of jobs and civil rights. And and the you know those promises were not entirely met. And 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 sadly they found not only that, but that it was a very, very, very segregated community and a police force that had that usually well, at that point, was all white, and there and lived outside the city limits, and and there was a tremendous amount of aggression, that um, that these people who were simply coming up there for jobs and civil rights experienced and witnessed, and that led to a an an, an absolutely expected collision course, you know, and I mean, there's a great quote by Martin Luther King, "A riot is the language of the unheard." And so that's what you see is these people find, I mean, to burn your own house down. And I know Billy and Harry and I kept talking about that. You're there, that, you know, how do I, how to get an, how to try to express that in a way that an audience can really embrace it. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. yeah, you always hear people wondering about that, not understanding that aspect of it. But um, Vicki, in the casting of it, um, did you also meet with the original people that, that like Melvin and Larry and some of the people that were being that, that were the the original people? And then I I didn't. You? I mean, no. I uh, we had a great uh, production designer and a lot of also historical photos of the actual people and the locations, and so that was informative just to try to get some sense of an essence, I guess, of them as as much as I could. But I didn't meet any of the 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 real people. I kind of uh, 
went by what I read about them and uh, Catherine's experience in talking to them and uh, just kind of went in my gut, I guess, yeah. you know. I would think that. it'd be a, just a tough film to cast. Uh, it's so it noteworthy. Hard. I mean, you did such a great job. Everybody yeah. is such really indelible characters. We wanted to get it right. Yeah, you did. <laughs> <laughs> so we wanted to do that. And, and also, it's uh, we just wanted to get it right. Mm. Yeah. And it was just a, I mean, just to her credit, just, I mean, there were like, over a hundred speaking parts, and not to mention the ensemble, which is already quite extensive, and how many people we looked at, discussed, and wanted very much to also work with emerging talent. And that was something that, you know, it would have been skewed differently had that interest not been there. You know, all of a sudden you would have a kind of, a you know, it just. Entity. Yeah, no, it was really exciting just to be able to get new people in there, just get <laughs> unknown faces or just and give them a shot and and uh, use that kind of raw, young energy that they had. And I mean, that was that's really one of the exciting things yeah. I find about about casting, Yeah, you know? So uh, that, that was great. It feels that much more authentic because you don't recognize, I mean, sure, I recognize Anthony Mackie, but you know, that's okay. He blended in so well, but there, those are faces you don't know, so you feel like you're with, between the docudrama exactly. style that you have and, exactly. and that. Exactly. Thank you. Um, I was curious, too, about how you recreated Detroit, because I know that, obviously, there were establishing shots there, but there was it was mostly shot in Boston, right? Yeah. We originally um, located the movie in Detroit, and we had all we had it look all the locations, and we were down to just about to build sets. I mean, we were moments away. And however, a year prior, um, the state had rescinded its incentives program. But we thought for sure the story of Detroit—they're going to want to support this—and and that wasn't the case. So. Um, along with the water went the incentives. But um, so then we, um, we relocated it almost within like a week and a half in Boston or in Massachusetts because they have a 25% rebate on above and below the line, which is significant. And although it was, you know, kind of a heartbreaker. I mean, it was wonderful to shoot there. And, and um, but what was great is I had already found all the locations. So I knew exactly what I wanted to match. And then we were able to, because of the money we, we had saved, we were able to come back to Detroit and do about um, uh, several days there just for the wider establishing shots. So you really did have a sense of, of, of place, I suppose. But, but having already located it there and then having to replicate it, it was you know the best of a not perfect scenario. <laughs> Well, you wouldn't know it. Again, it was very seamless. Um, so you, you've been drawn to controversial subjects between Hurt Locker, Zero Dark Thirty. What drew you specifically, and what draws you to all of those subjects, I guess? What, what, you know, we could be doing any number of other kinds of films, but you choose these gritty subjects. No, I, I wish I knew why. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Vicki, why do you think? <laughs> um, no, I don't know. I just, I think of film as... Um, I suppose more journalistic than uh, entertainment, al than only entertainment. I think entertainment alone is kind of not enough, and so there's a journalistic aspect of trying to supply some information that isn't readily avail available. Like in Hurt Locker, the Iraq War was, in my opinion, very underreported, and and yet there were journalists who were doing embeds over there, and that was information I was fascinated by. Um, are they telling you we have to end? Hey, <laughs> <laughs> oh, audience questions. Okay. okay. Anyway, yeah. so, that, that, so, we, uh, so that I thought was very interesting to understand what an IED was, what an EOD tech did during the day, or did in a day in the life of an explosive ordnance disposal tech. And so um, Zero Dark Thirty, why did, why did this particular odyssey take 10 years and in, in this case trying to unpack you know the what I think is really truly unthinkable the kind of brutality that is levied upon you know people in our society and so 
I think of them as informational. Absolutely. Um, yes, let's open it to the audience. Uh, way back there. Yes, waiting. Hi. Uh, first of all, I want to commend you all for what I thought was just incredibly engaging um, and a great story that illustrated a part of American history I had no idea about. So I want to first of all say thank you for that. There is one question that kept going through my mind through a lot of the movie, though, and that is why didn't anybody say there was a, a, shot, a, a starter gun? Um, well, not that everybody couldn't answer it, but I'll just, I'll grab it. Um, it's interesting. I mean, yes, of course, that's a, um, a question that one would have today. But if you were able to go into a time machine and go back 50 years, um, and the dynamic, the racial dynamic, as kind of reprehensible as it is today was even worse and the fear would have been too great to have even you know well there was a gun there was a gun yes somebody had a, I mean it would just probably would have ended in a lot more homicides I mean that was that was really the thinking and everybody I asked I asked both um, you know, people from the per period, people who had been in the rebellion itself, and also those, uh, a police officer who was our tech advisor. And just, you know, what you, you just wanted to kind of, you wanted to disappear. And um, it just underscores even more acutely the racial divide. That's a good question. Um, yes, right back there. Hello. You did that wonderful piece at the very end with the Detroit police officer actually helping him and saying, how could any human do this? And we all hoped that in the same situation we would intercede. Um, can you comment on what you found from the state police and the National Guard and what they said about why they didn't try to intervene and separate the local police? Well, the state police, um, that was... Uh, I, I really don't know. I mean, that all came from transcript. And the fact that they came and then they, you know, thought that it would just have been too uh, complicated to intervene or, or insinuate themselves. But the um, Larry being helped at the railroad tracks or being helped by the police officer, that came from Larry. And when he left the Algiers, he said he ran what he thinks was maybe 45 minutes. He just ran and ran. Now he had, he had like fractures in his, in his skull and he still was running. And then, and he was just, you know, so obviously distraught and he, he passed out on the ground. And then he, he remembers seeing this bright, bright light, which we realize now is a flashlight and this police officer holding him and um, telling him, you don't have to be afraid, and took him to the hospital, and, and uh, otherwise he probably would not have survived. But that story, that, in, that incident came from him himself. Um, I want to ask you a quick question about the terminology, because I know that uh, you mentioned an, a rebellion and unrest, and, and I know that riots are considered, it's considered more loaded. But what is the thinking behind all that? Because I know that, that also came up with the, the LA uh, disturbances, I guess, you know, of, of 92. Well, I would say that um, rebellion is uh, a more specific way of referring to that kind of uprising at that time. But riots, it's been called a riot as well. And, you know, it, they're sort of... I mean, one is perhaps more accurate than the other, and or more time sensitive than the other. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, back there. Hi, I'm really curious about you. You've worked with the cinematographer before, and I'm really curious about the process. Um, I mean, before it was Hurt Locker, but now you're telling a story that exists in actuality, and I'm wondering what your process was and how it was different 
in developing the look for this film? Oh, I can't say enough wonderful things about Barry Aykroyd. Um, in Hurt Locker, it's all pretty much all day exterior, which meant, and also it's the desert, it's the Middle East. I mean, it's just vast. Your canvas is vast. Here, it's very, very, very contained, all night, all lit. And I think what Billy had mentioned earlier, the key element that um, Barry, I mean, other than his incredible genius, but the idea of using the digital camera, which meant um, you could work in low light conditions, which meant I could work quickly because I did not want to subject the cast to this degree of emotionality over a long period of time. I mean, we did that whole interior probably in three weeks, maybe? Just about three weeks. Just yeah. about three weeks. And, and then he used, so digital being this very modern, you know, format or rather, you know, uh, image capture system, which makes it very clean mm -hmm. and it feels very very contemporary, but using a, a, a super 16 or 16 millimeter lens, which then degrades the image. And so it hadn't, far as I know, hadn't really been done before. So that's kind of an interesting um, paradox. You've got this motion capture or image capture system that can work in almost no light. So we could move very quickly. And then these lenses, which gave it a kind of a rough period feel and then we tend not to work with marks because I like to let and he will light an entire area uh, so an actor will be able to kind of really own the material and and go for many many pages if he or she wants I mean it's a very fluid freeing kind of process I think because of Barry's ability and it was breathtaking to watch in dailies too, because I mean, you were talking about three camera operators, mostly in like not not sets, so they're limited already in terms of where they can stand. And a lot of the times, I, if I've heard, and I know I don't know if this is correct, but like they didn't get to watch some of the rehearsals, and so the camera people come onto the scene. All these people are moving around, and the operators are having to find the action. And so what Billy and I started to notice was there's this wonderful kind of like nervous energy in the camera work, and at the same time, there's a narrative energy that's going on too. Because as they're getting to know the scene, they're doing these beautiful camera moves and, and um, shifting focus and things like that in rhythm with what the actors are doing. And that kind of choreography was really breathtaking because normally when you're watching dailies, you're of that kind, you're yelling at the screen because the camera people are usually missing a line or missing a particular action, but there's something amazing about Barry and his team where they not only were missing, weren't missing things, they were delivering these beautiful in-camera edits that um, we started to become really attracted to. And so much of the, the kinetic nature of the editing is really a credit to, to his team and his camera work. Yeah, I mean, we often, you don't often get to work with uh, camera operators and Barry operated the A camera who are storytellers like that. And it makes such a difference to the film and to our work, especially. And you know, once you get in sync with what they're in sync with the story, and hopefully we're in sync with the story, and it really makes for really a special thing. Mm -hmm. That um, it was the first time I've worked with Barry, and you know, it was really a, a treat. It was incredible. And during the Algiers Motel scene, that there was it was constant, right? That lighting wasn't being changed; they just kept shooting. Yeah, that seems really unusual. Well, Barry that. comes from documentary filmmaking, and so he loves, like, even I learned this from Hurt Locker, no rehearsal, no blocking. He wants to discover it. And, and so I would work with the cast. I knew what was going to happen. And, and, and then it's like, and then the camera department comes onto the set and just finds it in situ. And so that's why it's not, you know, the camera might be hunting, but it's genuinely hunting. It's not some sort of impositional movement to give it a kind of life or tension. It's not. They're discovering it. And, and um, I don't know, a tremendous amount of confidence to do that. That's so cool. Uh, yes, right here. Um, just a Please question. wait for the mic. Please wait for the mic. Oh. <laughs> Uh, just a simple question. Um, in your opinion, w uh, what do you think makes a good director? What, 
should one study and stuff like that. <laughs> Do we have a budding director here? Um, I am a storyboard artist for oh, animation, oh. but... <laughs> well, that's very critical. Um, what makes a good director? <laughs> I know. I would... Uh, it's, I mean, it varies so much. I, 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 I think passion and sincerity. You know, if you, if you believe, in, believe strongly enough in the story you're telling, something halfway okay has to come out of it. I don't know. It would be... <laughs> It's really about believing in the material. You seem to have such an eye for details, too. That seems like something that's very specific. Well, especially when you're working with a story that's real and, um, you know, making sure that, you know, like the hand over the hand on the wall, that, you know, it, it, it's great to get the kind of the broad strokes as, as sort of tightly knit as you can, but then it's the details that bring a story to life. You know, the, I don't know, the, like we had this incredible um, costume, uh, this woman that built the, all, the, all the wardrobe, Francine Tarchuk, and she, she, I mean, just the fabric was from the period. I mean, just things like little, de everything, nothing, the socks, something you wouldn't even see and and yet it goes you know those kind of details are kind of critical yes another question right there <laughs> loved it <laughs> um, as far as the, the socks go those are called thick and thins <laughs> and how about uh, the stingy brim hats <laughs> oh yeah lewis the hatter downtown detroit uh for Huh? Lewis the ha Harry the Hatter Harry was one. Harry the Hatter, yeah. And then Lewis on WSHB. Uh, so yeah, my wife and I are both from Michigan. Okay. You did an excellent job of recreating it. Um, Thank you. A very moving, very moving film. Uh, I just want to say that uh, I did have the opportunity to go to a couple Motown reviews after this in the late 60s. Uh, amazing. Uh, I think I like how you brought the whole musical act into it. Um, and of course, I think afterwards, uh, music played a big part in healing the city and everything. Can you speak to that? Well, I think that's a very good point. I mean, obviously, it was uh, intrinsic to the story itself because of the character of Larry. And here's this, here's this young man uh, poised at a precipice that could have changed his entire life and unfortunately uh, circumstances conspired against it but but so the element of music I think uh, was of course intrinsic to the piece because of him but also because of the city itself you know I mean this was and that's what drew Julie and Karen you know I asked them what, what brought you to the Algiers Motown you know it was just I mean and apparently the Algiers, that's if you were interested in music, if you're interested in Motown at that time, didn't matter where you were, you went to the Algiers. I mean, I guess it's a little like Woodstock in, uh, you know, the 60s on the East Coast, you know, a little further east. So um, it, was, it was a, you know, galvanizing location. And the music was what defined that, that era, obviously. Just one more question, please. We have time for just one more question. Yes, right there. You, yeah. Oh, no, I just know that I'm Oh, right, right. okay. <laughs> <laughs> you can't speak to yeah. me. <laughs> Thank you. Hi. Um, quite actually, possibly one of the most important films I've ever seen. Um, thank you all for bringing that to the forefront. I think all of us are quite moved by the story itself, and I. I'd love to know more, you've touched upon it, on what happened to the people that were abused, and thank you for, if you could speak to that, but actually, I'd like to know where those bloody police officers are. How are they watching this effing movie, and where they are, you know, what the hell happened to them? And I, yeah, that's kind of my big question. Aside from the gun, I also, that was a great one. What? One's still alive. Yeah, one is still alive. 
One is still alive, two are deceased, and yes, they were acquitted. And um, the trial is a compression. It took place over a year and a half. There were three trials, but nonetheless, they were acquitted. And, and um, you know, maybe the film in and of itself is a kind of vindication, uh, you know, of the, for the, the civil rights of the victims. But, um, yeah, I mean, it was maddening to, especially, well, at every moment, like the state police coming, the National Guard, then turning around and walking away from, you know, from this situation and finding it all just, um, I don't know, it just, it, it's really shocking and surprising, especially as I was doing it day in, day out, shooting this piece. And, you know, you can't help but get angry you know, just angry, you know, in a way that, you know, you just want to go back in time and change it somehow, you know, but but sadly that's not possible. So, um, so what is possible, though, is to expose this story, shine a light on it, because it had been sort of secreted away, um, or rather was not very well known outside of Detroit, not even within Detroit necessarily very well known, but... Um, tell this story or expose this story and then have conversations like this um, and hopefully bring what is period to today to the, you know, like you're looking at Charlottesville, you're looking at situations that are not terribly different, sadly. And, you know, it's, I sort of feel like the film is two acts of a three act structure. I kind of, we all, conspired together to provide two acts, and now the third act is is yours. <laughs> okay, on that note, that is an excellent note to end on. Thank, thank you, thank you. <laughs> Catherine, Harry, William, and Vicki. Thank, thank you so much. <laughs>